And it is my great honor and privilege to stand before you and minister today. And let me begin it by wishing all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. And to the mothers through whom we became fathers, we give thanks to you. We bless you. Thank you for putting up with us. Hallelujah. And my prayer is that God will speak to us today, all of us, fathers and mothers. You know, when we think of father and his place in the family, many roles come to mind, doesn't it? We think of fathers as the disciplinarian in the home. We all remember those dreaded words when we were growing up and mother would say, you just wait till your father come home. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Right? Mom will raise her voice. She will even yell at us. But it was father who meted out the discipline, whether it be physical or not. Amen? Yeah. Father is also provider. Providing for his family comes from his sense of duty, his sense of identity, and his manhood. And different cultures have different messages about what it means to be a man, a husband, and a father. But most would agree that one of father's primary priorities is the role of provider. It is said that real men bring home the bacon. Amen? They support their families. They work in the fields. They may work in the factories. They may work in the mines. They may work in the forest. They work in the offices. But... Even though their jobs are dangerous, it is their responsibility and they understand it as they are providers for their families. Father is also protector. Do not threaten or endanger his family. God has endowed him with the muscles and the brawn and the strength and the temperament to be and to function in the role of protector, especially when it comes to the woman in his life. Amen? See, no self-respecting man would stand by and let anybody disrespect or advantage his wife in the home or outside of the home. He's going to move swiftly to defend that wife. And the same applies to his daughters. You men, you fathers with daughters, when your teenage daughters was being picked up for a date, father goes out of his way to size up the intentions and the word of those young men. He wants to meet, he insists on meeting that young man to look him in the eyes intuitively and to size him up to figure out what his intentions are. Because father senses and assesses every young man who comes to his daughter. There's an unspoken message that passes between them. This is my daughter. You better treat her nicely or else. <laughs> Someone has said that father, a father protects. It is what gives him meaning. But here's another aspect of this protection, a spiritual aspect. How do we protect our families for the spiritual attack of the enemy and the consequences of sin? And this is the focus of our message this morning. In fact, it's the title of the message. How to protect our families from sin and its consequences. Right. Our text comes out of Genesis chapter 16. Amen. And it surrounds an episode in the life of Abraham. I have selected for our theme... A right motive, but a wrong method. Okay. Right motive, wrong method. Good. And as a prelude to the reading the text, let me provide an, in, a, an overview. In this text, Abraham is about 85 years old and his wife Sarah is about 75. Even though they had a long lifespan, Abraham and Sarah are both approaching post childbearing agent yes and in their eyes this has a this is a problem since god has promised to make abraham a great nation and he yet does not have a child and way back in chapter 12 god had made a promise to abraham 
He's, now the Lord has said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and I will make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Ten years have passed since that first promise. And maybe Abraham and Sarah are struggling with some doubt. Am I speaking to anyone here? When God makes a promise to you or when you grab a hold of a promise in the word of God and you are running with it and years and years are passing and you are seeing nothing coming and you begin to doubt in your minds. And so Sarah takes matters in her own hand and she encourages Abraham, Abraham to take her maid servant as his wife so he can produce a seed. Her motive was right. She wanted to help her husband. She could see, she knew of the promise and she could see his distraught and she was wanting to help but her method was wrong. God promised Abraham a seed but he didn't clearly say it was going to come from Sarah. And so she reasoned and rationalized in her mind, well, maybe this is the way God is going to provide a seed. But this plan backfires. Because after Hagar becomes pregnant, she despised Sarah, the word said. Hagar probably uh, saw herself as possessing a higher status because now she was pregnant with Abraham's child. And so the word says she despised her, her mistress. You see, in those days, society often looked down on women who couldn't bear children. Because bearing children, especially sons, provided protection for the family. It allowed them to gain wealth and it continued the family name. And having children was the major role of women in that society. And now that Hagar was pregnant with Abraham's child, she saw herself superior to, Abraham, to, to, to Sarah. And this caused great conflict in the home, which had a tremendous future ramifications and issues. Ishmael, the son of Hagar, would also later despise Isaac, the future son of, of, of Sarah. And Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations, and Isaac is the father of Israel, and these nations have been in conflict for thousands of years. So let me read the text now. Follow on with me if you have. Chapter 16 of Genesis. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And, he, and Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Sometimes we blame the Lord. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And I want you to note this. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. I want to read this next verse very carefully because I want you to listen to the words. I'm going to pause. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went, on, went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said to Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into your bosom, and when, you, when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. And the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sehi, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. This narrative in many ways resembles what we saw in the Garden of Eden. Satan attacked the first family through the same kind of thing. And the consequences of that failure were drastic. It affected the entire human race with sin. And we see, this, we see similar drastic consequences 
for David's family when he, because of his failure, David had an illicit fear with another man's wife, and when she became pregnant, in an effort to hide it, he had her husband murdered. And this led to the sword never departing from his home. And we see here a grave consequence with Abram's failure in taking another wife and father and a child with her. His failure resulted in two competing seeds over thousands of years that are still going on. So how can we protect our families? How do we keep and shield our families from the spiritual kind of failure, the attacks of the enemy, and the severe consequences of sin? You know, God always forgives when we repent. But how sadly the consequences of our sin last for generations. So what can we learn from Abraham and Sarah's failure here? You know, me, you and I, we may not have the same problem, but there are some principles that we can lift out of this text to help us to protect our family from the enemy's attacks and the consequences of sin. Let me give you a few of them. The first one. We must be careful of the influence of culture. Amen? Amen? You see, God promised Abraham that his seed would be like the stars in the sky, but there was a problem. He had no children, and Sarah was barren. Therefore, Sarah approaches Abraham. She says, since the Lord has kept me from bearing, why don't you go in unto my maid, and maybe I will have children by her. Sarah's intentions was good. It was not bad. She wanted to help Abraham. You see, God never directly said the seed would come through her, and so she decides to take action. Wives, be careful. Be careful when you overstep the Lord's commands and you decide to take things in your hands. Amen? Asking a husband to take her maid servant as, as a wife, but that, you see, this is where I'm, I'm going. It was a cultural thing. Amen? In, it was her job as a wife to provide her husband a child. And in the case of barrenness, a wife could often give her maidservant to her husband to produce a child. And when this happened, the child or the offspring would belong to the first wife. But there is a problem with this idea and this plan. As the narrative back was in chapter 12, Abraham took his family when there was a famine and he went down to Egypt. And there were some failures down there too. Amen. And what do we see here? What we see or what we do not see is that we do not see any prayer here. We do not see Abraham consulting God. Right. The altar is absent. There is no prayer. There is no consulting the Father. There is no asking for direction. Somehow it never seems to enter Abraham's mind to consult the God who had supernaturally led him out of his land 10 years ago. Somehow it doesn't seem that he wanted to consult the one who had preserved his family as they crossed the wilderness. He didn't consult the one who had rescued him from his previous blunder in Egypt. The one who had just read, go back and read this chapter, chapter 15 right before that you will see God appeared unto Abraham and he confirmed the promise. Amen. He spelt out that Abraham you are not going to see the promise yet because your descendants will be 400 years in, in Egypt in bondage before you can appropriate the land. Abraham forgot all of this. Somehow it never occurred to Abraham that the one who had kept Sarah barren and without child for all these years could easily just give her a child. That's right, man. As we would see later. If only he had consulted God, I am confident he would have gotten a clear picture, a clear perspective of why this was going to be a bad idea. But the facts are that Abraham again did not consult God. And even at this point in scripture, even though there was no written scripture to forbid this kind of indulgence, God had clearly said way back in Genesis that a marriage was going to be between one man and one woman. Amen. Abraham should have known better. And as mentioned, this caused a great problem in their family and the descendants throughout history. You see, when Romans told us 
When Paul in Romans says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, it was, it was right then and there. These Romans were already conforming to the word, to the world. And Paul was trying to tell them, do not conform to the world. Do not conform to culture. You see, we must not let culture dictate how we raise our families. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because we have been delivered from the world system. Amen. And the world system is empowered and ruled by the devil. Scripture calls Satan the ruler of this world. His imprint is on every culture. It is on government, education, business, entertainment. Think of anything you can yes. today. Yes. Satan's imprint is on it. Yes. And the very fact that we Christians miss that causes us great confusion and troubles in our lives. And there are similar trends in modern day cultures that are destroying families. Scripture clearly teaches the leadership of the man in the home. Yes. Come on, men. Support me here. Amen. Because Ephesians says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Yes. Talk to them. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Amen. Therefore, as a church, Church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. Amen. Scripture clearly teaches that wives should submit to their husbands and to the Lord, and that husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. Amen. But modern day culture will tell you everything different. It will teach you that there is no headship in the home. Even though this conflicts with practical reason. In every company, in every business, there is a head. And when there is no head, there is confusion. And headship does not mean inequality. You know, in the military, a captain and a corporal has the same rank. But in order so that there will be order, the corporal must be subject to the captain. And it is the same in the house, in the home. But because most homes don't follow biblical order, there is chaos. Some cultures teach that there is no authority in the home, while others wrongly emphasize either the male or the female's authority. May I say to you, neither of them is biblical. Why? Because the wife is not a doormat, a doormat, and neither is the husband, and neither should be so chose, uh, uh, treated. We should not treat our wives like doormats. Neither wives should you consider your husband as a doormat. Because both are designed by God with wonderful gifts. Gifts so that we can, that, it, that could be exercised in the context of love and authority. Husbands must love their wives and wives must love, submit to their husbands. And sadly, in many marriages, even in Christian marriages, this, is a, this affects us because we do not practice biblical gender roles. Amen? Amen? There's a lot of talk about gender these days. There are two genders in the home. Man and woman. Husband and wife. Father and mother. And like Abraham and Sarah, when we do not function in the biblical roles, gender roles that God has assigned, then there we, we find problems because we are basically rebelling against God's order. Hallelujah. Culture also would at times promote children over the marriage union. In many cultures, children are the focus of the family instead of the marriage itself. Families spend all of their time and their effort trying to take care, making sure their children go to the best schools, get the best training. All that is fine, but many times it is done to the detriment of the marriage. And this is, part, this is in part what happened here to Abraham and Sarah. You see, in that ancient, ancient culture, tremendous focus was placed on having children for their obvious benefits. Why? Because children were the retirement plan. Children were the defense plan. Amen. Children was the plan to achieve status. And because of this, children often was the focus of the marriage. And we saw this also with Hannah and her husband. 
Hannah was so distraught about her not having a child that we see her husband cry, Oh, Hannah, am I not better than ten sons? Hallelujah. And it is the same today. The focus of bearing a child was suffocating that marriage and their relationship. And the highest, do you know what is the highest, the highest rate of divorce is in the first year. Yeah, you know why? Because young people come to a marriage with unrealistic expectations. But do you know what is the second? The second is around your year 20. And we ask ourselves, why are people who have been married for 20 years getting divorced? You know why? It is because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because the focus of their marriage has been their children. When a baby came, the mother literally went into the next room with the baby and the father was left alone by himself. No intimacy anymore. Tell me, ladies, ain't that true? Yeah. And from infanthood until adulthood, parents' focus was the child's education and their extracurricular activities. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, the marriage was lost. You see, when God started the human race with a man and a woman, he meant that to be the center of the family and society. And we see that in Paul's admonition in Ephesians. The woman is called to submit to the husband as unto Christ. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the child. For both husband and wife, the focus will be, and here with the order, God first, your marriage second, and then your children. Amen. And when we parents model those priorities, our children benefit. Because when they see a biblical model of marriage at home, then they will follow. And when they don't see it, they themselves suffer. You know why? Because somehow they think that the marriage revolves around them. And when they grow up and they go out in the world, they fail. Because in truth, the world doesn't belong, doesn't revolve around them. And they learn the hard way. And ultimately, they repeat the same mistake as their parents with their own children. And this was common in those ancient cultures, and it still happens today. Men, women, mothers, fathers, we must make our marriage the priority relation in the home. Amen. Hallelujah. So that our children can learn properly. Culture also promotes promiscuity as acceptable in the, in the marriage union. Sadly, in many cultures, especially back then, it was acceptable, especially for men, as we see here with Abraham, that they may have many wives. And in these cultures, the man who is the patriarch of the home, the unquestioned leader, that came with certain amount of freedom to enjoy the comforts of outside women. The man would marry one woman so he could have so he can have children and increase his social status in life, and then he would have. Deputies on the side. <laughs> now this is no laughing matter. <laughs> Solomon married the princess of Egypt to strengthen his alliances, but he had a harem of concubines. This was so socially acceptable in those days that go back and read Judges 19. We even see a Levite, a priest, a pastor, if you will, with a concubine. So socially acceptable what it was this in those days. And this gives a growing acceptance of this kind of practice today. For some people, it is acceptable to have what they call an open marriage. <laughs> to invite other members into their marriage. And for others, it, it is like what Abraham, it was acceptable for a man to have many wives or mistresses. And you know, you may think this strange and foreign, but there are people right here in this room who have come from families where father had two wives and two homes and two separate families. It was only a generation ago that this kind of practice was indulged in. And there's a growing Cultural trend in, in, in our society, they, they call it hooking up. 
where men and women, they sample relationships with others. And when it doesn't work out, they just move on to other relationships. And this has made monogamy or one man, one woman archaic and old fashioned and out of date. And if we are going to protect our families, men, mothers, fathers, we must, we must stop this trend. Amen. Why? Because scripture, scripture doesn't allow it. Read your Bibles properly and see that scripture condemns this and we must condemn it also. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Secondly, we must be aware and careful of the enemy's attacks through intimate relationships. Notice with me that it is Sarah who is the one that asked Abraham to take another wife. That's why I read that. So when I read that, I, 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 I stopped and I read it carefully in my mind. And, and the very wording of this verse carried the weight and the import of, sin, of what Sarah was, was, was suggesting here. And as commonplace as this may have seen, this was bound to end badly, and both Sarah and Abraham should have known it. You see, Proverbs says, for three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear up under. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with food, for an odious woman when she is married, and for an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Another translation said, a maid who replaces her mistress. This is exactly what happens here. This was a right motive by Sarah, but it was destined to have a bad outcome because she was using a wrong method. Amen. And often the enemy attacks our families from right within and through close, close relationships. In fact, in Genesis 12, when they went down to Egypt, it was Abraham who asked his wife, you're going to lie and say you're my sister. Yeah. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve, when Eve was deceived, it, the Bible says Eve was deceived, but it didn't say Adam was deceived. He was right there, but hear what the word of God says. He wasn't deceived. He sinned with his eyes wide open. Why? Because he hearkened unto his wife. Careful about close relationships and how they impact your life. And this is what happened here with Abraham. Can you imagine with me? Imagine if Abraham's neighbor had come over and said, Boy, Abe, you know you're old. And Sarah, your wife, is also old. But she has a young maid. Why don't you go and take her as a wife so you can produce an heir? You think Abraham would have taken that on? It probably would have fallen on deaf ears. But look how the enemy attacks. He brings it through his closest person next to him, his wife. And so this happens to us as well. Because Satan uses this tactic. He even tried to deceive Jesus through his chief disciple, Peter. And he knows this. And he will attack. Through a spouse, a child, a parent, a cousin, close friends. Amen. Why? Because they are the ones we trust. Yes. And we are more prone to be influenced by them, by close people, people close to us. And so Satan knows this very well. Now don't mis misunderstand me, men. I'm not saying to use this principle to, don't disagree, to, to disagree with your wife. No? Okay? No, 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 no. A godly wife is a, has a lot of godly wisdom and we must need, we need to listen. I, I listen to my wife all the time. I don't always do what she say. Right? But you have some things you have no choice. You just have to listen. But that's okay. Go ahead and listen and then when you're done, act and let your actions be guided by your understanding and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. You have no choice sometimes. You just have to listen. That's okay. Go ahead and listen. Because if you don't listen, oh, confusion. And the same applies to you, wife. The next day, your husband tell you, honey, 
let's pack a bag and go to the, the beach instead of going to church today. What are you going to tell him? Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Be careful of the influences of those around you. How's my time going there? Another way we commonly see this attack on families is through parents' influence on their children. Now, this, this was supposed to be part of a, a session that we were supposed to have. But because of my cough, it was delayed. So I'm bringing some of it here. To, so bear with me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that all culture is bad. But much of it conflicts with scripture because Satan is the ruler of this world. And that includes all culture. You talk with, with many youth pastors or, or Sunday school teachers and they will tell you. All we do is trying to train these children from the influences of their parents. Because we parents teach our children according to culture and not according to biblical theology. We are raising our children like that. And the attack of the enemy of, on parents continues in marriage. Another top reason for divorce is interference by in-laws. Many of you here are in-laws or you have in-laws. You see, when God brought Adam and Eve together, he said that a man should leave his father's house and he should cleave to his wife. And this means that a husband and wife was meant to form a new family. Amen. A separate family. And yes, they are still to call to honor mother and father. But above that, they must honor God by prioritizing their spouses. Amen. Amen. And unfortunately, many marriages are pulled in multiple directions and cause great conflict because of in-laws. Because the wife still wants to submit to her father and her mother over her husband, and the husband is still trying to please mommy over his wife, and nothing but confusion. And Satan just doesn't influence true family. He uses any number of close relationships. The wife has her girlfriends, the husband has his buddies, and I'll tell you many times, if most times, if every time not, they are not good marriage counselors. And if we are going to protect our families, then we must be aware of the enemies attacks through our close relationships Amen. and God. And we must test everything against the word of God. Amen. 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 And lastly, we must be careful of male passivity. Sadly, the person most responsible for this debacle is Abraham. You see, when Sarah, his wife, comes to him with this sinful idea, he doesn't say no. <laughs> he doesn't say, let's pray and seek God. He just passively goes along with the plan. Yeah. In fact, in, in Genesis, in, this, in verse 2, when Abraham, then the word says, and Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. It's reminiscent of what God said to, to, to Adam in the garden. He said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of your wife. And we know how that turned out. Not only is Abraham passive while Sarah tells him to take Hagar as his wife, but he's also passive when she complains about the consequences of that decision. He simply says, behold, thy maid is in your hand. Do as you want with her. Basically, he says, it's your problem. You deal with it. <laughs> and in her state of insecurity and anger, the Bible says that Sarah mistreated Hagar so that she has to run away. And what do we see? Do we see Abraham repenting? Do we see Abraham protecting Sarah, uh, Hagar? Do we see Abraham protecting this unborn child? After all, the Bible says she was given to him for his wife. This is his wife. She's not just Sarah's handmaid anymore. She is his wife and now the mother of his child. But do we see him protecting her? No, throughout this narrative, Abraham is passive. 
And sadly, male passivity is a growing problem for us today, even in Christian homes. Most often, the wife is the more spiritual person in the family. She is the spiritual engine in the family. She is the one promoting church attendance. She is the one encouraging the reading of scripture. She is in the one leading prayer in the home. She is the one taking care. We are our men. And men, God called us as husbands to be like Christ. To wash our family with the word. To care for our family. We are the ones that are responsible in the home. Yet many husbands and fathers refuse to stand up and lead. Not only spiritually but in everything. Amen. Now I'm not here to beat up our men. I am here to encourage you to be the men that God called you to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And men God has called us to be husbands so we can lead our home. More so when we are fathers. And when we don't lead, everything is going to fall apart. We must be actively seeking to lead our home, especially spiritually. We must pray for our wives and we must serve them. Christ was the disciples leader, yet he functioned in the ministry of servant. He humbled himself and he washed their feet. Husbands, even though we are the leaders, we must do the same. We must be meek and gentle like our Savior. We must pray for our wives. We must serve them. We must lead them. And when necessary, we must even forgive them. Now, there are many other principles helpful that we can draw from this text, but I don't want to take you too long. So I'm going to bring this to an end right now. How do we protect our families from sin and the consequences of sin? Be aware of cultural in influences in your life. Don't let culture dictate how you raise your family. Amen. Don't let culture dictate how you rule. Don't let culture dictate how you lead. Amen. Instead, let the word of God be your guide. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Be aware of the enemies attached through those closest to you. Yes, listen to your wife. She is your closest confidant. Bounce everything off of against her. But then let your actions be guided by your wisdom and understanding of God's word. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And men, be aware of this passive thing that's going on. Let us get up. Our wives and our families are depending on us to lead. They are looking for us for protection, not just physical but spiritual also. Because God is ultimately going to hold us responsible for where our family goes. We saw the clip pastor showed there. 93% of the family comes to church when the husband and the father is coming. Amen. Be aware of this male passivity. Our, God is, our families are looking for us. They are counting on us to be fathers in our homes. So let us rise up. Let us take our place as the leaders in our home. Let us become the men God is looking for us to become as we lead our family. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Happy Father's Day. I trust that God has spoken to us today. All of us, husbands, uh, wives, mothers, fathers, Families on the whole. Lord, you have given your word. Yes. Now, Lord, strengthen our men. Give us backbones to rise up. Strengthen us in the places in our spiritual minds and hearts and bodies so we can lead our families. <laughs>